Hey everyone, thank you for joining us yet again for our second episode of Inhabit. Uh, I am Corey DeVos. I am here with my very good friend, Ryan Olke. Ryan, how you doing, man? Doing good, thanks. Good. Glad to see you again, man. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super stoked that we're uh, doing our second episode. Our, our, yeah. We did our first episode last week where we were just sort of um, introducing the show and letting people know just sort of what we will be um, up to in the coming months. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to just sort of jump in um, today. Um, so I was thinking, Ryan, a, a couple things. Um, we want to tell people what we're going to be talking about today. Yep. I also just want to sort of, I think, remind people why we're doing this show. Yeah. And, um, you know, sort of what we're, what we're looking to get at together. Um, yes. through doing the show together. So maybe you can, you can sort of remind people of um, what we're doing. Yeah. So there's a couple of ways we can talk about what we're doing with the show. And I was really happy to see the response to our first episode. It really seemed like there was a visceral response, which is exactly the kind of response we we're looking for, for this show and habit. There's something that was, that felt embodied about how people um, responded. So inside the integral community, if we're going to be really specific, we know that integral theory is very cognitively heavy. It's a mental workout and uh, it's incredibly useful. So the mind is part of who we are and uh, integral theory gives us really great ways of viewing and understanding the world and our experience. Uh, at the same time, it can be very easy to stay in that world where we're mainly, mainly in, our, in the mind and, and relating to the world in a cerebral way, which again is included in our experience, but it's not limited to that. So I think a lot of people who are naturally drawn to say philosophy or um, integral theory, um, one of the struggles can be uh, embodying fully all of who we are, incorporating and in, uh, downloading and integrating and permeating our experience with what we sense through integral theory. Mm. So, Put it really simply, I mean, you know, this is called integral life. So, you know, we're really emphasizing the life part, the living part here, um, complementing the theory and the maps. So, you know, as you'll see with our episode titles, they have a very simple focus. So inhabit the territory of you. That was the first one. And we wanted to, you know, specifically say territory, like your lived experience. And then today is uh, inhabit your spiritual life. So this is going to be the, the format. Every episode is we're going to really look in one domain of our life and as much as we can practically examine that and work with our experience around that domain. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say comes yeah. up for me. Uh, I don't know if you anything to add in terms of what we're doing. And then I know we can frame today's episode a little bit more too. Yeah, totally. Well, no, I think that was, that was a beautiful setup. Um, you know, and I, I do think that one of the things that makes, you know, the integral approach to spirituality so, you know, appealing to a lot of people is that it's, you know, there, there, there is, there's a lot of intellectual sort of rigor that comes with it. It's sort of yeah. a, it's sort of a spirituality for smart people in a certain yeah. way. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, but at the same time, it can be so intellectual, especially since, you know, uh, you know as, as you mentioned, it can be just so cognitive and so heady um, because the way we're generally, you know, taking this material on is, is you know, by reading books and watching presentations and all that. Yeah. Um, sometimes we can get sort of lost in the intellectual components of this. And I think yes. that, that sometimes when we get, when we get so sort of... Um, suffused with these beautiful ideas, these big ideas, these grand yeah. narratives of life, the universe, and everything, we sort of lose touch with the ordinariness of it yes. all. You know what I mean? There's, um, we get sort of caught up in, in the semiotics of enlightenment and in the sort of myth, the mythology of self and the divinization yeah. of the universe and everything gets so big and so spiritual oh, and so yeah. meta, you know what I mean? That it's, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, we want to sort of help people, you know, maybe collapse that a little bit, maybe find a little bit more simplicity. Maybe, you know, there's the sort of um, Zen cliche, Ryan, that we were talking about pre-show of, you know, at first in the beginning, the mountain is a mountain. And then in the second stage, the mountain is not a mountain anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not a mountain. It's this spectrum of 
dancing energies and lights and shadows and projections and perceptions and all of that. But then stage three, the final stage, the mountain is a mountain again. And the only yes. difference between first stage mountain and third stage mountain is at the first stage, the mountain is on that side of my face. Yes. And at the end, the mountain is on this side of my face. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I've always really, really loved that, that sort of cliche because it, it, does, it emphasizes just the, the radical simplicity, the radical ordinariness of the yeah. spiritual territory yeah. and how we oftentimes, you know, overly complicate things um, in a certain mm -hmm. kind of way. Yeah. And actually, I want to bookmark and make sure to come back around to that uh, model that you just had there, because I think it's actually more than a cliche, to be honest. It's, it's a uh, fine, simple model uh, mm -hmm. for awakening. And uh, I mean, all cliches uh, are cliches for a reason, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're reducing or hopefully eliminating the gap of experience, you know, and this is about intimacy. So, and I've used, used this quote all over the place, but Dogen says, uh, enlightenment is intimacy with all things. And in that third stage of uh, the mountain is now a mountain again, there's intimacy with it. Mm. So I think that's the thing that can happen is we can lose intimacy. Another just silly example that pops in my head a lot is sex, which of course sex pops in my head a lot, but <laughs> it has a practical purpose here is that like, you can have a bunch of theories and talk about sex, but what do you want to do? you want to have the sex, you that's know, that's right. the point. Now that's overtly that way. And it, it is good to talk about sex and, you know, in this day and age, it's become more important, but that's just sort of thing. It's like, you want to, you want to be engaged with life, you know? So that's, that's what we're that, trying to do here. I, I'm laughing over here because it reminds me, you know, I've had this criticism um, of, of myself and of integral life over the last decade or so, which is, you know, we know sex sells, yeah. Right. And yet when integral tries to sell sex, it's like, let's have these massive, you know, complicated discussions about gender dynamics and mm -hmm. yeah. sex, you know, masculine and feminine polarities yeah. and all of that. And it's like what people really want yeah. to talk about is, you know, fucking. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> and it's not to, it's not, it. yeah, it's not to downplay the importance of having those discussions. It really is. You just got to know where, where it starts feeling like an avoidance of intimacy like, is it helpful? And if it is, then it's moving me towards intimacy That's so right. that I can participate in life, you know, uh, versus being a witness to it constantly, you know? So, yeah. and no one can say that you have to look at your own experience to decide, it, you know, and get feedback from who you're in relationships with. Yeah. Are you showing up? So I think that's a really great intro. Um, and, you know, especially in this episode, you know, um, uh, inhabiting your spiritual life and the, the model you gave in the Zen tradition, um, and real quick, uh, let's, I want to read that question just so we can, so we're going to, we're going to do this question and we're going to, I'm going to guide a practice and I'll talk about that in a minute. So we're going to do a little practice up front yeah. and then we'll explore much more in depth. The question we got from a user, which I think our listener, which, uh, yeah, help frame this thing. And we're going to dive into more. And, and Ryan, since, yeah. since, uh, you're going to be tasked with answering the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In order for me to feel useful here, why don't I uh, just read it? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Perfect. Great. Um, and then, yeah. And then this question, I think, will frame a lot of uh, the discussion that we're going to have over the next hour. Sounds good. Um, so let's see here. The question was, uh, and this came through about a week and a half ago uh, through the integral life uh, field. I, th I, I, I think, Ryan, this question might have actually been originally addressed to Ken Wilbur for the Ken Show. Oh, yeah, that's right. But I sort of hijacked it and yes. said, uh, you know, this, this, this show that we're doing together will be a great place to sort of unpack mm -hmm. this. So the question is, um, I have been meditating for a few years now, specifically during the last year and a half. I've turned it into a daily practice. Good for you. Uh, my question is how to link that meditation space with action. How do I link within the same day my meditation space with my daily activities? And I'm not referring to the contemplative or meditating mind to be fully present or aware in what I'm doing. My question falls into the other side of the equation. It's on how the meditation springs to action or is reflected in the active part of the day, whether interacting with others or working on my own. In other words, how does my daily meditation guide my, da my daily actions? And I'm not talking about the big picture actions, but more the daily chores. Mm -hmm. And that's from uh, Don Mijeris, I think his, his last name is. And mm -hmm. thank you for the question, Don. It's a, it's a really great and important question that I think really sort of gets at the heart 
yes. uh, what we're talking about today, which is the difference between our spiritual maps and the actual lived moment to moment territory. Yes. That's a very good question. And, you know, Corey, if I can plug myself briefly for a practical right. purpose. Um, so my work uh, as a teacher of awakening is called awakening in life. And I, I named it that specifically for this question. There's so much in it. And uh, especially this particular episode, we're really diving into that. And uh, I'm finishing up a sort of in-depth practical guide um, for awakening a life that has some principles and some maps and uh, practices in it that I will put out this week and people can find that at awakening.training. Now, um, I'm throwing it out there because if you know, you're interested in some of the things I say, there's some more stuff behind it and I'll reference things like that. So putting that out there, but I was really happy to see this cause I'm like, this is exactly yep. what gets me excited. So um, I, maybe we'll do a practice now. Yeah. yeah and then we'll, we'll great. circle back around. So the practice we're going to do today, last time we did uh, a practice of arriving, which is basically um, I'd consider sort of like a protocol to begin practice and that's to arrive in the space you're at. So I want to provide practices that build on top of each other and that you can take and cultivate this depth of intimacy, um, uh, spiritually speaking, and also across other domains of life. So go back and listen to that episode for that more in-depth uh, guidance on the arriving practice. Today, I wanted to do uh, a somatic practice that I have from one of my teachers, Judith Blackstone. And... Uh, she calls this, it's a mouthful of tuning to fundamental consciousness, but uh, I call it just a simple embodiment practice. And we're going to do the very stripped down version of it. And we're going to do uh, a shorter version of it. I have a longer version of it, uh, uh, 17 minutes about, and that's on, you can find on awakening.training. Um, today, we're going to try to do about 10 minutes. So I'm just acknowledging that we might be moving this along a little quicker, but I encourage you to slow it down on your own. And uh, this practice is explicitly inhabiting the body. So we'll just get started. So ah, take a moment to really arrive at where you're at. And you, know, you can take in the space, look around, see what you see, hear what you hear. Your smells, smells, those smells. I have incense burning, so I can smell that. These just simple acknowledgement of the sensory experience. And take a few deep breaths, slow inhalation. Let the exhale go wherever it wants to go. And if you can, when you take in that slow inhalation, see if you can sense the very core of your body and making contact the core of your body with your inhalation. Now close your eyes if they're not already closed. And feel the contact your feet is making with the floor or whatever is beneath your feet. Really sense the physical contact your feet are making. And feel as if there's no separation between your feet and the floor. Now come into the internal space of your feet. Here you're not aware of your feet. You are the internal space of your feet. You're living as and in the internal space of your feet. And 
And don't worry if this doesn't feel complete or full. Allow yourself to just gently inhabit more and more the internal space of your feet. And when you do this practice on your own, you can take all the time you need to come home into the internal space of your feet and your body. Resting inside the internal space of your feet As you breathe in, see if you can stay down this far in your body, down in your feet. Then when you inhale, you don't lift up out of your feet. And even if you do lift up out of your feet, you can just notice that, notice that movement that probably was unconscious before. You can be curious about that. Now coming into the internal space of your ankles and your lower legs up to your knees. And you're inhabiting the internal space to the very core of your ankles and lower legs. Not outside them, not on the surface, not above, but letting yourself really rest inside the internal space of your lower legs. Coming into the internal space of your knees. And here, see if you can find the very centers of both knees at the same time. You might notice that these points waver or oscillate that's okay. You can find one point at a time and then both together. And as these points start to settle, you'll notice a settling of the mind. Stillness and balance of the mind will be revealed. Coming into the internal space of your thighs, from your knees all the way up to your hip sockets. Resting in the internal space of your upper legs. Now coming into your pelvis, to the internal space of your pelvis, allowing yourself to rest downward to the floor of your pelvis. And 
And here you can sense the physical contact your sits bones is making with whatever you're seated on, seating on. Again, see if you can allow yourself to stay down in your internal space of your pelvis, even as you inhale. Now find the centers of both hip sockets at the same time. You might need to allow your awareness to settle down a little deeper, not resting on the surface, but really resting in the centers of both hip sockets. And here you can feel and sense your lower body, your legs at the same time as your upper body and your torso. Now coming into the internal space of your abdomen, from your pelvis up to your ribs, in the front of your stomach, all the way through your lower back. You really feel like you're coming into the full volume of your abdomen. And as you come into this part of your body, you might find that you naturally want to move or shift, and that's okay. Now coming into the internal space of your chest from your sternum up to your collarbone and all the way through the back, through your shoulder blades. Again, gently and patiently seeing how much you can rest in the internal volume of your chest. Now coming into the internal space of your shoulders, allowing them to soften and relax. Coming in to the centers of both shoulder sockets at the same time. Coming into your upper arms, elbows, forearms, wrists, palms of your hands and your fingers. Coming into the full internal space of your arms all at once. And that you are this internal space. Coming into the internal space of your neck. 
allowing yourself to rest downward in the internal space of your neck. Also coming into the internal space all the way down through your collarbones. coming into the internal space of your forehead, around through your temples. Here, see if you can find a small point in the very center of your forehead, not between your eyebrows, but up a little bit above that in the very center of your forehead. This point might not appear in your mind or maybe it does and it moves around and that's okay. Let's see if you can allow yourself to settle. Allow this point to settle in the very center of your forehead. You can imagine, visualize it as a little point of light Now you can drop back behind that point as if you're seeing it from inside your mind. Coming into your eyebrows and your eyes deep into your eye sockets, allowing your eyes to smooth and become continuous with your face. Coming into the internal space of your nose, your lips, mouth, chin, your jaw, and your cheekbones. Coming into the very centers of your ears. Now inhabiting the internal space of your brain from the front to the back, allowing yourself to rest in this internal space. inhabiting the internal space of your head all at once. Seeing if you can find the very center of your head between your ears, very subtle and refined awareness. Now inhabit your whole body all at once. Experience living as one singular internal space of your body with nothing left out. Now without leaving your body See if you can sense the space in the room or in the space of wherever you're at. And that the space that pervades you also pervades the room. And this is just one continuous space. And now slowly open your eyes. And again, inhabit internal space of your body all at once. And 
and attune and sense the space of the room. And again, this is one continuous pervasive space. Okay, I don't know how long that was, but hopefully but I know not. that was that was gorgeous. Great, I hope. Um, uh, and what what I what I if it can we, can we yeah reflect on that a little bit yeah because what I notice right now is coming out of that space and into this space is it's sort of like I can feel the blood sort of coming back up to my brain in a certain kind of way. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh -huh. I, I think what you just offered the practice you just offered, which was tremendously simple but mm -hmm. powerful mm -hmm. it's an opportunity i think to sort of tease apart all the various ways that we enact and illuminate ultimate reality mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. as you're going through that you're you're not only creating sort of this cohesive integration of the body itself but when you're yeah. telling us to inhabit the internal space of our yeah. ankles yeah. Right. You, you, you're enacting reality in a, in a, in a different way from that space. And I noticed sort of different mm -hmm. qualities shifting from, for example, from the ankles to the pelvis mm -hmm. and both of which were an opportunity for mine to sort of like take a step back and say, okay, there's other ways to perceive this reality. There's other ways to relate with this sort of moment to moment spontaneous mm -hmm. arising of experience yes that isn't necessarily so cognitive and the challenge of you know as i'm feeling those sensations and as i'm just sort of trying to notice yeah. you can also feel mind sort of like generating all this noise and trying to sort of um track <clears throat> everything that's happening and and yeah i've got this little internal monologue that's sort of narrating the experience for me and i yeah. you know have to sort of be careful that I don't fall into again, sort of this, um, this, this, this mental chatter that, you know, and, and yeah. obviously, you know, doing the practice over and over again helps, helps reduce that chatter, but it's an, it's nice to do a practice like this because you can just feel how differently you relate to these things just by focusing on different parts of your own body, yeah. different parts of your own sort of sensory, um, yeah. experience. Yeah. Thanks. Corey. That was really great um and right on and you know there's so much to say it, this practice is very very simple and it's there's even more to the this foundational practice but it provides us with so much uh there's so many things to explore and layers here but just to say that you know when we talk about mental chatter coming up basically we're talking about attention and awareness collapsing onto a part of our experience now, we've been talking about mental, but it could uh, be uh, reactivity too. It could be emotional. So for exam example, we can collapse on anxiety, right? We might be having a really intense experience of anxiety and we're aware of nothing else. So this can happen in really profound, debilitating ways, but also can happen in very simple ways. Just attention awareness collapses. So what this practice does is, is it's trying to say, let's not have it collapse. Let's, because the, this body we're in, this life we're in is our birthright. It's inherent. It's who we are. So there's no objective reason that we should be, you know, dissociating from our feet, you know, or, uh, or, or our stomachs, you know, and then of course, qualities that correlate to them. There's no reason that we should or have to do that. Mm -hmm. So here we're just coming back in and inhabiting it. And then this very much applies to anything else we're doing this quality of what that feels like to really inhabit and try to show up more fully in our own uh, bodies is going to be similar to whether we're talking about politics or social media. It's just that those are going to be much more complex domains that invite us to get collapsed and, you know, worked up. Yep. So anyways, there's a lot we could talk about that, but uh, hopefully that was a little, that was helpful. Yep. Um, well, and I think yeah. there, just to mention, yeah. right? I think there's also a breadcrumb trail leading from that practice you just guided for us to uh, Don's question 
I think yes. that's yeah, Don's question, which yep. is, you know, again, as we're coming out of that experience, I can feel sort of, you know, I, the way I framed it was I can feel the blood returning to my head. And mm -hmm. the opportunity here is like, okay, well, and that's fine. You can return to mind, but keep all of this that we just, you know, went through together, keep that online simultaneously. And that I think yeah. is, is a challenge that um, Don is asking about. How yes. do I carry this forward? How, um, mm -hmm. you know, how can I make it so that every act every action I'm taking in the world is sort of its own meditation in a certain way. Yeah. So there's a couple, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of things we're going to talk about with this, but first I would say um, we don't need to have a model of perfection that itself is an obstacle. So like if, if we have some spiritual ideal that somehow we're going to always be super illuminated, you know, um, or whatever our description might be, that's just not going to be the case. And when I talk about awareness or intention collapsing, that's going to happen. That's guaranteed because it's part of the human experience. And whether or not we want to assert that it's possible to 100% always maintain that kind of presence, you know, whatever. I have my doubts about that. But can we cultivate a deeper capacity to be less fragmented, to come back to ourselves and to come back to presence after feeling fragmented? Yes, we can do that. So that's really important. Um, but what, another interesting thing is like when we did that practice, if you have an experience in that meditation where you really felt present, where you didn't feel like there's a separation between you and your body and what you're experiencing, there's not two things. We, we have to, the question comes up is like, what else is needed? That was what I've asked from that perspective. And especially when we open our eyes, right? And we're doing this attunement to the space outside of our bodies and inside of our bodies. This whole question of, separation and how do I integrate starts to fade away because you aren't separating things by, especially by grounding in the body, we're not creating a separation. We're saying, I want to be present in this form, in this life. Now we're, we're centering that on our individual experience and our individual body, but by extension, you know, that would be the same thing as being a part of a we or being a part of this physical world, you know, um, there's not going to be a separation. Mm. So I think it's about how you approach practice. That's one is like, what are your assumptions and what, and how are you practicing? So if we were to practice that, um, we were attuning to awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Now we can experience the quality of awareness without doing it in the body. You know what I mean? We can actually just let go completely of the body. And that's an interesting experience, you know, to just drop body, you know, and, uh, try to attune and abide as pure awareness, right? Mm -hmm. The question is going to come up though, after you come out of that experience is now what, right? So if it was just like, oh, I qualities of awareness of being vast, open, luminous, you know, uh, pure, you know, okay. Oh, wow. That's a profound experience. And that's part of who we are. But then you, then you come back to the body, you know, whoop, you know, now what? So <clears throat> we're just using this practice that can happen with any practice where, the more it's disconnected from the body, the more that we're, we're not using life itself as the medium of our practice, you know, so the more that it's going to, we're going to create an obstacle to separate, you know, of, of feeling like separated. Now, there's a, some other things to say here that often, and when you gave the, the um, example in Zen of a mountain is a mountain, a mountain's not a mountain, a mountain's a mountain, three stages of uh, awakening. When the mountain is a mountain, the first stage, we, we don't, it's unconscious relating. We don't, we don't have a conscious relationship to it. So what we do is we disembed, we start dismantling and disembedding from life in order to fully see it. So we start breaking down experience in various ways, right? So, um, you know, Buddhist, the in Buddhist practice, you can have things of breaking down sight, you know, there's the object, there's the eyes seeing it, then there's mental formations of it and all these things that happen and like, holy crap, I'm breaking it all down. And this idea that I have of mountain and the concept of mountain doesn't hold up. There's not that concept of mountainness, you know? So we disembed. So we get, we see that more clearly. We see the emptiness of it. We see the, the interconnected, you know, inter interdependent arising of what makes a mountain a mountain, but we kind of have to go through this natural phase of disembedding. And then we go through a process of intimacy, of coming back to it. We don't remain in this transcendent space. But it's very natural, you know, as a progression. 
it's just going to, it's hard to avoid. It's hard to avoid that progression of separating from life of sorts. There's going to be some feeling of that yeah. as we start to tease apart our experience rather than taking it as this like unconscious, di- undifferentiated blob. So we can make some sense out of it. So we can get out of habitual response. We do that, but then we have to start coming back into life and embracing life. So that way we can participate. We can be intimate with life. We can respond. So I want to make note of that. And I'm glad you brought up that model because some of this is just going to be natural. Mm -hmm. But if you start or you change your practice right now to including, for example, the body, that progress process is going to be much easier. You're going to have less difficult of time of saying, how does this practice relate to life? Mm -hmm. Because you're grounding it in your body, you're grounding it in life. So you can make an easier go at it. Like when I started practicing Buddhism, I did the other way. I didn't really do much with the body. I just was like, you know, you know, eject out of it um, and then had to integrate it. <laughs> but people are getting wiser now and, and just starting with the body automatically. Yeah. So those are a few thoughts. Yeah, no, I like, I, I like that <clears throat> a lot. Um, and two things come to mind when you were talking. A is how, you know, that transition from mountain, not mountain to mountain uh, really follows, you know, what Ken describes as sort of the process from fusion the differentiation to integration. Yeah. It's a normal process. And no yep. matter where you are in that process, you are probably exactly where you need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, there are some unique, I think, challenges and obstacles that present themselves at each of those sort of yes. steps. And that's, right. that's what we're trying to sort of, you know, help navigate right now. And then Ryan, when you're talking about presence and particularly embodied presence. Mm-hmm. It actually reminded me of another Zen story, which is, mm-hmm. um, which is one of my favorites. It's, uh, it's a story of this Zen monk who was a very, very um, diligent meditator, practitioner. Um, and he lived, uh, he lived on a lake across the lake from a friend of his who was a Zen master. Mm-hmm. And uh, this Zen monk was, was you know, meditating and he had this experience of, of awakening and it was powerful. And he summarized it in a, um, in a beautiful poem, which I wrote down here. He says, uh, mm. I bow my head to the heaven within heaven, hairline rays illuminating the universe. The eight winds cannot move me, sitting still upon the purple golden lotus. It's a mm. beautiful poem. That's a beautiful poem, yeah. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So he sends this. He's you know, pretty impressed with his own sort of spiritual attainment, <laughs> right? Yeah. So he sends yeah. it to his friend, the Zen master, who lives on the other side of the lake. And the Zen master returns the manuscript. And so the monk opens up the manuscript, so he looks at it, and there's nothing written down except a single word just scribbled over the, the cover of it. It just says, fart. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, the monk gets pissed off. He's like, who does this guy think he is? Oh, you know, man. This is, I feel like that's something I would do. This is beautiful <laughs> poetry. And this is like my experience of enlightenment and awakening. Who the fuck is this guy? So we go, he angrily goes across the lake to confront the Zen master. Yeah. And when he gets there, the Zen master's not there. There's just a note on the door. And the note says, the eight winds cannot move me, but one fart blows me across the lake. <laughs> That's funny. That's good stuff. That's a, I, I love that story because it's, it, it is, it's a difference between having this sort of cognitive un- understanding yeah. of, of presence and yeah. of timeless reality and all that. But the ultimate yeah. test is, you know, it's what Ken often says, does your experience have a beginning in time? Does it have an ending in time? Mm-hmm. Well, that's nice, but that ain't it. That mm-hmm. ain't the real thing until mm-hmm. you can tap into the experience that has no beginning and has no end you're just you're you're it's fine but you're playing the imaginal game here Mm -hmm. you're still playing with spiritual ideas and not necessarily playing in the spiritual territory itself and every once in a while you need one big loud fart to remind you yeah (laughs) right that we're that we're sort of um leading ourselves on in a certain kind of way yeah and you know so that's great. I'm going to have to write that one down. I feel like I, I would both be the, the guy who writes the poem and the guy who writes fart on the poem. Like <laughs> I'm, right. both, I'm both people. <clears throat> um, so I think one advantage that folks who follow integral theory, one, one of the advantages they have in spiritual practice is dealing with paradox, you know? So for example, Ken didn't just write some books on waking up, you know, he also wrote books 
on four quadrants and lines of development, all these kind, kinds of things. So they're all happening at once kind of thing. So it's very important to remember this, this paradox and that one of my mentors had a great tweet that I still love. He says, don't worry, it's just everything and everyone happening all at once. I just love that phrase because that's very true. So, you know, there is a timeless presence. And when you're trying to clearly and directly experience that, you have to approach that in a certain way. And that often means letting go. I'm, uh, I'm right now leaning towards using the word of release and response. So that's what I have in my model. So release is letting go, is completely letting go until you release completely the source, if you, if you can use other terms. So yeah, you're gonna have to do that. That's what you do, right? So you know, if you go to the gym, you're gonna work out. If you're gonna write poetry, you pick up a pencil and write poetry. It's just different activities. Um, but this timeless presence isn't more real than the manifest reality of this life life mm -hmm. matters mm -hmm. what's happening matters even if yeah that's a confusing thing that people really goof up in contemplative practices they they start seeing everything as literally illusory which from the perspective of timeless presence that's true you know like you, you but still it, you actually one of my favorite things i i, I I reference in my head, but the movie Dodgeball, which it has a has a bunch of inappropriate stuff in there, and I get it. Like it's there's some very uh, politically incorrect things in there, but there's this one scene where uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Rip Torn. He's uh, an old dodgeball player from back in the '50s or something like that. And he was a legend, and he's now trying to teach these goofball, unathletic guys how to play dodgeball. And uh, one of the guys is really repressed with anger. He doesn't show any anger. He's just always, you know, I'm happy. It's fine. And his uh, wife, who apparently is like a mail or order bride kind of thing, she hates him and she's constantly, you know, saying mean things to him, whatever. And, but he's still just saying, mm, everything's fine. And uh, he's sucking at dodgeball. He won't throw, he can't throw the ball um, at all. And Rip Torn says, you got to get mad. And he's like, I don't, I don't really get mad. And then he punches him in the balls and he says, are you angry now? <laughs> <laughs> and there's that kind of feeling of like, you know what, if someone slapped you across the face or farted in your face, you know, it's like, you're going to have an experience. You're going to be like, Oh, there's this all an illusion. Yeah. Right. So, you know, life matters. Yeah. No, it does. I, I love that paradox too, because you know, again, mountain, not mountain, mountain. Um, yes. Ramana Maharshi says the, the world is an illusion. Yes. Uh, Brahman alone is real right brahman is the world so there's a complete circuit there and you do at first you do you have to differentiate sort of you know the ultimate reality which is out there or behind here or back there or, you know however whatever sort of preposition you want to use to locate it yeah. um but then you have the world itself which is oh this is you know we're, yes. we're sort of trapped in this illusion yes. um and that's a really really important i think uh, you know, period in sort of the, the awakening process is to realize how much of the world around us, or at least how much of the way we think about the world around us is ultimately illusionary. But then everything collapses, that, that sort of probability wave collapses once again, yeah. because suddenly Brahman is the world. So yeah. if Brahman has been the world this entire time, Where's the illusion? There is no illusion. So it's this, it's this, um, it's the paradox that you're talking about, being able to yeah. sit with that paradox, realizing that this ultimate timeless, unknowable mystery of reality is not different than this conversation that you and I are having right now and the words that are coming out of my mouth and the space that I'm in and our respect and affections for each other and the ideas we're trying to share. All of this is infused, suffused with. Yeah. that the same amount of ultimate reality as you know the internment camps on the border yeah um all of this sort of shares that that same weapon <clears throat> in a certain yeah. way and that's another great little awakening model that you just shared from ramana maharshi and now the thing is, is like so that last stage is non-dual non-duality and we can just refer to that as presence if we want we can call it different names and and the practice we were doing is an attempt at that. 
you know, so we're being present in form, but also that pervasive awareness that is unchanging, uninjurable, inherently whole. We're, we're inhabiting and attuning to both at the same time. Now, that still doesn't tell you what to do with life. Mm-hmm. So it's not an end. It doesn't say what should be done. And that's a big mistake. That's a big leap that can happen in idealism and spirituality is that when you get to that stage, you therefore know everything and know how to respond to everything. And that's just bullshit. That's just not the case. <clears throat> you know, we just, just, just not the case. We don't have any examples except we have mythical stories about that. But, but the question is, is like, okay, still, how does that relate? So somebody, I could, I could hear somebody saying, okay, I've actually had a really profound experience of this uh, non-duality, but now what? Because actually in that non-dual experience, there's still a sense of everything is okay. You know, there's a a deep, profound okayness. There's no fighting. There's no tension anymore. There's no, there's no, it's all released in that space. And it's a big relief, you Mm -hmm. know. Um, That's where you can see like this striving and efforting and spiritual practice, you know, just evaporates. And it's, ah, okay, it's, it's relieving. But you still say, okay, now what? Now what am I doing? And that's still, that's where that move towards intimacy happens of saying the, the world matters. And somehow I'm still going to show up for this mm. and respond to it and struggle with the messiness of life. The thing is, is that we can infuse that and we can do, the, we can respond from a different place. So there's some supportiveness that can happen from that uh spiritual side if we're going to put sides here of like um you know releasing into non-dual presence that can still be supportive of how we show up in life so a few ways that can happen uh is one that we have more room for experience it doesn't give us absolute room we don't just have oh i have space for everything no problem no it just we're going to have more room because we have more okayness. We can access that a little bit more. And if there's more room, then there's more ability to see things, to experience things. There, um, we can have that more than intimacy. So yes. we can't, we need that. So that's one way that relates. Um, uh, just less resistance around things. And even when re- resistance comes up, we can allow space for that. We still have to work with that. So for example, in the body, we might be carrying around trauma or emotional wounds uh, patterns of being relating to the world that no amount of awakening in, in terms of a non-duality is going to undo. That's still here. You know, I'm not, I'm five foot 10. That ain't changing. I'm not going to be six foot five tomorrow or whatever. You know, it's like, we're still in this, these forms, these forms persist um, and they matter. So But we can say, well, I want to work with that. And on the foundation of inherent wholeness of this uninjurable space, I can work with that, which is injurable. Yes. I can, I can work with my experience to change it. So I think it's very possible to integrate those two. And and that's exactly what we can do in a practice like this with, you know, Judith's um, healing practices is built on that foundation, what we did earlier. And then we can work with um, that manifest condition changing experience. Mm. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And, and, you know, what you're talking about, what it really reminds me of is um, Ken's very simple phrase, hurts more, bothers you less. Yeah. And the resilience is what allows you to be bothered less by mm-hmm. sort of the, the, the pains and the torments of incarnation, right? Yeah. But if you don't bring that other side, if you don't bring the hurts more, yeah, right, then then you are, you remain disembodied in a certain kind of sense, because you're not allowing yourself to feel, yes, non-duality, the non-dual experience tells us everything is perfect exactly how it is. And that's why there's more urgency than ever to make things better. It's another one of those sort of paradoxes. And, yeah. you know, as you're talking, Ryan, it reminds me of, um, you know, some, some personal experiences that I went through mm. that had a very transformative expe- uh, uh, effect on my own um, sense of spirituality and how it intersects with my just daily life and mm. identity and all of that. Mm. And, you know, and, and, and let me just say, you know, up front, I'm, I'm generally, um, these days, I'm not very comfortable for whatever reason talking about my spirituality. Hmm. feels um, intimate to me and it feels like something that um, 
the moment I make it into an object to try to share with someone, it diminishes it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm less interested in sort of the objectification of my own spirit. I'm, I'm more interested mm -hmm. in inhabiting the, 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 the sort of the timeless subject mm -hmm. um, of, of, of that reality and a little less so in having, you know, all these sort of spiritual conversations. Uh, yeah. Now that's very different than where I was, you know, when I first came into integral, when I was in my twenties, um, so much of my identity was based on sort of an objectification of my spirituality. I mean, I wore these spiritual ideas like mm. an armor almost, you mm. know what I mean? This became yeah. like my, the, my new source of identity. I'm having these experiences that are unfolding within me and they just, gosh, they feel so big and so important and so true. And mm. I just want to let everyone know about it. And yeah. I, you know, I really wore this sort of on my sleeve. And, um, you know, that was, that was sort of my, what I consider to be my sort of youthful expression of, of my own sort of spiritual yeah. life. Mm. Um, and then, you know, there was a, a sequence of events that um, really started to shift things for me. And the first was simply my daughter being born. Mm. I mean, you want to talk about maps becoming territory. I mean, if you're interested in developmental maps whatsoever, and then you have a kid and you're like, okay, here, here it is, right? Mm -hmm. This, yeah. this is the territory I've been preparing myself for my entire life. Um, so there's, you know, I think a natural maturation that comes uh, when we have children. Um, but the other thing was, you know, my daughter was, um, and a lot of people who are watching probably know this story, but for those who don't, my daughter was born with a, uh, a rare uh, chronic li liver disease called biliary atresia, where she was basically born without bile ducts. And um, she, she eventually needed a, a full liver transplant by the time she was a year and a half old, which was um, harrowing. I mean, it was, it was the most terrifying experience of my life. And mm -hmm. it was a crucible that forever changed how I just relate to conversations like these. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you spend any time whatsoever in a children's hospital, I mean, this is this is the place of nightmares and miracles, right? I mean, you are confronted with sort of the ultimate injustices of the universe. Why the hell are there sick children, mm -hmm. right? What kind of God would allow there to be children with cancer and with these just disabilities? Yeah. And, um, you know, you spend any time at all in a children's hospital and it's going to transform you one way or the other, simply it doesn't matter how open you are or how closed you are, you're going to walk out of there a different person. And what it did for me, Ryan, is I, I, I noticed what it was doing for me is I, I began to notice in that space how so many of these spiritual ideas and concepts and sort of idolatries, they didn't help. They didn't do anything for me in that space. They didn't give me any sense of additional meaning. They didn't they didn't help. They became just sort of um, ornaments of my spirituality, right? And this experience, I think, stripped away so many, so much of that ornamentation. Um, and it, it, the spiritual, the spirituality I walked out with was different than the spirituality I walked in with. In that, it became much more quiet. It became much more. Um, much less sort of bombastic. Mm -hmm. I became much less interested in talking about it and instead wanted to start talking from it, if that yeah. makes sense. Um, yes. And what I began to notice, and you know, as I'm having this conversation with you, I am, I'm trying to use my mind to sort of objectify it and say, okay, well, what, what, you know, what's a basic framework? What, what did this help me do? And to me, it really felt like it, it boiled my spiritual life down to three real simple categories. I mean, real simple, like as simple as it gets. Mm -hmm. And the first one is what we've been talking about this whole time, presence, mm -hmm. right? And with that presence, I mean, this is, this is sort of one of those, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big umbrella of a term because it's a presence that comes with discovering that unshakable mountain within you, right? Yeah. And life becomes sort of a... Uh, an unstoppable object hitting an unmovable subject, right? Mm. And life is the explosion that's, that's sort of created. Um, so presence was, was number one. 
um, when I was in that experience, there was something in me that was able to both um, endure everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, that also allowed me to continue just putting one step in front of the other and trust that there will be ground underneath my feet. And that was, that was, I think, the gift of presence. Number two is empathy, mm -hmm. right? So much of my spiritual life has been boiled down to basic empathy and human kindness. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, we're going to have shows later on about things like social media and, th and yeah. things like that, where um, I think we're really beginning to see the effects of the fact that we are less empathetic today than we were even 20 years ago. There's studies about it. Ken and I just talked about this in mm. our, our conversation last week about gun violence. Empathy is something like 40% lower today than it was 20 mm. years ago among college students, mm. uh, which is, you know, that's a civilization killer right there, mm. right? And to me, on a much more personal level, it's, it's like if your spirituality doesn't have this, it's not just a capacity for empathy, it's a need for empathy. It's, you know, it's, it's part and parcel of that sort of uh, awakening experience mm -hmm. is that I can now slide into perspectives. And sometimes, especially when you're in a children's hospital, sometimes you don't want to slide into other people's perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's overwhelming and it, it squishes you like a bug. You're, you're, you know, it's one of those things like, okay, I am walking through hell right now. Mm -hmm. And I know in the room right next door to me is someone who's walking through a, 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 an even worse hell than I am. Right. And mm -hmm. I have to choose in the moment, am I going to empathize with that person's experience or do I have to shut myself down so that I can remain present to my experience? And I think that there is, again, it's a developmental sort of thing. Mm -hmm you kind of do sometimes have to oscillate. It's really hard to do both at the same time. Mm. But at the end of the day, you're naturally doing Tong Len for you know, every person, every face, every kid that you see in, in a hospital like that. It just starts yeah. to come online sort of naturally mm. uh, because it, it actually, in a certain way, it, 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 it's sort of a selfish way of coping even. Like I'm going to drown in this if I don't find some way to metabolize it in the process. Yes. Yeah. That's the second piece is empathy. And then the third is simply, you know, simply it's the most difficult to talk about, but it's skillful action in order to reduce suffering where you see it. And that gets really, I mean, there's all sorts of different moral algorithms out there. Um, that people use to determine how, you know, what skillful action is and what reducing suffering actually means. And it's not, you know, it's not a very clean space. It's not, in, you know, sometimes you have to be deliberately partial in order to create the most good for the most people, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a lot more difficult than just saying skillful action, but still there is a simplicity there. There's, uh, there's this, this thing that comes in line in you that just wants to be able to navigate the noise in a certain kind of way and to make your, to make your contributions so that other people don't have to suffer as much mm -hmm. as they do. Mm -hmm. And the three of those combined, just presence, empathy, skillful action. To me, it's like this, this has become a new, um, integral framework for me that is it's sort of the simplicity on the other side of a lot of complexity you know what i mean and yeah. it took a lot of complexity and a lot of trauma and a lot of heartache to sort of get there um but now that i'm there you know it's just funny how i'm i'm you you might be able to, i'm uncomfortable talking about it mm. right now because i don't want to um diminish that but by simply trying to make those aspects of my subjective experience into an object i feel like i'm even that even in discussing them i'm sort of fetishizing them in a certain kind of sense and um it's not altogether comfortable and that discomfort is a new experience for me and i'm at, and i'm actually trying to figure out how to um let that inform whatever this wherever I am in that awakening sequence right now, mm -hmm. trying to allow that to, to um, come online in a more authentic and a more full way. So that's, that was just for me an example of how, yeah. you know, all of this imaginal stuff, which meant so much to me. And again, it's, it becomes almost mythological. It's like, yeah. what is the universe and what is my place in it? And you can see all the demons and angels and, you know, all of that sort of laid out in front of you. And then there's, just the acceptance of the radical simplicity of ordinary 
reality as it presents mm-hmm. itself to you right now and right now and right yes. now. Yes. Yeah. That's really beautiful, Corey. I'm uh, very happy you shared that. I think it's such a great example. And I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't see any issues with you expressing that. I don't know. You know, you said about your uh, uncomfortableness. So, I mean, like that's, to me, that's what it's about is, is everything you just shared. I think that was a really beautiful, heartfelt, genuine, authentic expression of that deep natural integration of what we consider spiritual and what we consider life where they just those separation that separation collapses all the idealism that's a big deal is like all that idealism is evaporated Mm -hmm. and that's not evaporated yet there's still more to go and some people are thrust into that like you were with your daughter you didn't have a choice about that you know and so you had to just go through that and honestly sometimes if depending on people's spiritual inclination sometimes they could double down in some traumatic ways on ideals as their coping Easily. mechanism. Yeah, and, that, and then that can get real painful and really ugly. Yep. But I think a lot of people, that's what happens. It's just like, what's true still? What remains? What is, and it's a very uh, powerful filtering process when you go through something that's um, traumatic and difficult. Um, yeah. So I, I think, well, and, what I noticed, right, is that each three of those sort of pillars, right, they really depend on each other. I mean, they really do. Yeah. If, you, if you have all the empathy without the resiliency, you, you drown in it, right? Yeah. I mean, you just absolutely drown in it. And if you have the resiliency without the empathy, you just sort of become cold to yeah. it all. And yeah. if you don't have, you know, at, at least the, the, you know, the desire to create skillful action in your life and in the world – then you're just sort of impotent with it all and you're just stuck with it. Mm-hmm. So much of spirituality can already feel like masturbation and navel gazing. And yeah. you know what I mean? it's, it, it becomes just so self-centered. Like I, I, I'm yeah. trying to find all these ways to, to cultivate myself and to awaken myself and to do all yeah. these things within myself. Yeah. And what often gets lost is like, okay, well, that's, that's awesome. But what are you doing for your community? What are you doing to make your neighbors feel more yeah. seen and more loved and more, you know, um, yeah. what are you doing to actually reduce suffering right now um, yes. in, in the world? And there's not one, any one answer to that, but the, you know, the question is, is, is that present for you? Are mm-hmm. those drives present for you right now? Um, and that, that, yeah, that to me just becomes sort of the stuff at the core, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, basically that's kind of circling back around to the beginning here of, you know, are we, why, what's our intention with spiritual practice? Honestly, what is it? You know, not what do we say it is, but what is it? Mm. Um, And um, often for most of us, it is, uh, I want to escape. I want to get beyond this suffering of life, you know, and it can, and that's the movement at first is just like, how how can I get around it? Because life sucks, you know, and, uh, but taken too far, you know, that's, it's like, and it's an escape so for escaping we're trying to transcend and then even worse we're like then trying to create out these big ideas about how life is and try to live in these you know godlike realms of spirituality and it's like okay um versus dealing with the nitty-gritty of life um and it doesn't you know like i said so before in your your experience all that idealism just it's evaporated and drops away and what remains is something that's way more authentic, way more immediate. Um, it doesn't change. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's not something profound, you know, like that, mm. that gets talked about in uh, contemplative traditions. It's not that like, Oh, there's nothing profound or extraordinary. It's just that what that experience is and how we experience it in life is very different. You know, like it's very different if I'm, if you're going on a retreat and trying to get out of the world and trying to access some, transcendent experience and be like oh yeah this is it this is where i want to be you know forever versus like that experience at the hospital you know of like you know of being cracked open completely you know in in a similar way really um but it has a totally different quality and meaning and and purpose so and i like you know the phrase you said talk about it versus talk from it that's a 
big differentiator mm. is how much are we talking about it versus how much are we talking from it as it. So when we were doing that practice earlier, um, you know, living as the space in the body, not aware of it, that changes things. And at that point, like, that's why I think like, I guess it's, you worried about, uh, how you're talking about fetishizing or anything like that. It's like, I don't think, I think that actually it's the opposite. That doesn't happen. It doesn't matter what the words are, but when it's coming from a organic expression, mm-hmm. one's lived experience, to me, it's always beautiful. No matter how articulate or inarticulate it is, it's worth so much more than any pontificating, you know, about spirituality when it's about, you know, you know, yeah if it's pointing to something so that's a really great way of saying is like am i living as this from this or am i creating it as some object to continue yeah. to chase yeah i get the sense that where i am in that process right now is sort of an over an over correction in my steering from you know again from just having such a spiritualized ego for so long right and feeling like god aren't i fucking important because i have this spiritualized ego and god i'm going to do important things and that's going to make me feel important and yeah. it, it's so much of it just becomes, again, these ego games. Now, when it comes to integral spirituality, I want to remind people, you know, the goal of integral spirituality is not, you know, spirituality is not hostile to the ego, even yeah. though the ego can oftentimes be hostile to spirituality, right? So I think the spiritual impulse is to not kill the ego, but to make the ego transparent to itself, to make, you're actually trying to make the ego bigger, right? That's what development is, is you're, you're, incrementally making your ego bigger and bigger and bigger, more capable, more capable, more capable. But you're also, you know, through these awakening experiences, making it that much more transparent. However, the one thing I notice is that from the perspective of your ego, and this is, I think, one of the reasons, Ryan, why it can be so hard for us to grok just how radically simple these enlightenment experiences can be. Because Mm -hmm. from the point of view of our ego, the ego says, okay, well, if I'm going down, I'm going down in a blaze of glory you know what i mean Mm, the ego wants like cgi explosions for that sort of radical spiritual territory on the other side of it all it Mm -hmm. expects these like you know and these big visions of light and love and and oftentimes that's not how it presents itself sometimes it does but oftentimes it's really not how it presents itself it's i remember you know reading ken as you, you were mentioning just how ken writes about these things yeah and what ken will do often is he'll just write you know, page after page of this beautiful prose that mm. is so intellectually nourishing and it illuminates so much of reality and, you know, and we, we just eat it up, we devour it. Yeah. And then at the end of those paragraphs, he'll just write this little, you know, simple paragraph, this beautiful Zen sort of um, description. And, you know, not only does it sort of act as a you know, almost like grokking point for everything he just said, Every, all the pieces kind of come together in those little poems, but he's also sort of moving out of all that complexity and reminding us how simple this really is, right? Okay. At its very core, just how simple. It's so simple, you could, you almost always miss it. That's how simple yeah. it is. Yeah. And in my 20s, when I was reading that, it was almost like, you know, he writes it in such a way, he writes it in such a way that, that you know, you can feel sort of your, your mental constructs that he just spent pages reinforcing for you. Then he gives yeah. you this little Zen poem and they kind of fall away and you get a taste of that experience. You get a taste yeah. of, that, of that territory. But I remember after sort of mind comes back, right? And now I'm thinking about, you know, that little blip of an experience I just had, how... Um, in a certain kind of way, unsatisfying, it felt. It felt not to me, but to my ego. Because again, my ego wanted an explosion. It wanted to go down in this, you know, yeah. firework display. Exactly. And right. instead, I just get chop wood, carry water. Yeah, that's eventually where things go. That's, that's kind of what we said at the beginning, is that like there is naturally some developmental process there. And even if we start with a, a model of awakening that includes that, where we say, okay, this is, we're not going to, front here we're going to say like in the end this is going to be very very ordinary but you know for a while i might be like well this is really kind of fascinating it's kind mm-hmm. of like cool oh, wow you know that's going to be natural we don't have to like poo poo it you know but like just to be aware of it and you know uh, when we talk about the perfection and the sim- uh, simplicity uh, it's very important sometimes when people think about these words because sometimes they get a little confused um like when we talk about non-dual presence of being 
like just this, just this thusness. It's perfect because nothing needs to be done. That's why that, that word is used. It's not a, a qualitative assessment. You know, like normally we say, oh, this piece of chocolate's perfect. You know, this, there's an ideal there, but it's sort of almost pragmatic of like, there, no matter what you, where you move, no matter what you do, no matter what you think, no matter, nothing doesn't change that foundational presence. It always is. It's just taking different forms. So that's why we say perfect. Or if you want to say, sometimes the word pure is used and people get confused about that. And that's how you can see that in spiritual communities where they emphasize some sort of external purity, you know, as like, oh, that's what we got to do is be pure. And that's a condition, but nothing you can do to fundamental reality is going to make it impure or pure. It's nothing. That's so it's as it is. So I just wanted to make mention of those two terms because we use it a couple of times. Um, but that's why it's all really simple. It's really ordinary and mm. chop wood and carry water because it doesn't need anything. <laughs> but the world does need things. And that's where we talked about response. And your, your example of in your life, I think is a beautiful, uh, you know, just heartfelt example of those of spirituality and life happening all at once such that there wasn't even a differentiation, you know, in that moment, words don't even come close, you know, to describing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's one of those things where, you know, thank you Lord for these, um, traumas, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and more than anything, just thank you Lord that, uh, you know, my little girl is doing so well. Yeah. You know, a beautiful daughter and family. Yeah. And you know, uh, quick thing, um, there's that Stephen Colbert, Anderson Cooper interview going around. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet, but I've heard it's absolutely touched. I love it when Colbert talks about his grieving process. Yeah, the two of them are, it's one of the most genuine, vulnerable conversations I've seen in kind of uh, mass media or media of that size, you know, of Colbert and Anderson Cooper. I was like, wow. Uh, the the cameras could have been off and I felt like they would have been exactly the same. And so they spend half that interview. It's a long one, like 40 minutes or so, but they spend half of it talking about their grief. And Colbert is really fascinating because, you know, he's a Catholic. So you, in terms of integral theory, you know, we might, the way he talks about his religion sometimes would be like, Oh, is this an ethnocentric sort of sociocentric version of, of Catholicism, but then other ways and ways he lives yeah. His spirituality. He's deep to me. Yeah. And, you know, he said uh, in there, um, he said something, Cooper, Anderson Cooper was quoting him about life. And, and there was, I think it's actually from Lord of the Rings, which I don't think I love about Colbert. <laughs> totally. Uh, he's, it's something about like punishments of life are also gifts, something like that. And uh, Colbert said that existence is a gift and existence is filled with suffering. And it's very simple, you know, and that's like when you were talking about your story, like when I hear that, I don't care about any of the amount of the books I've had and the retreats and things I've done and these experiences, it almost anymore, it's like, that's what matters. Like that, what he just said there and the way he said it and the way that it was felt because he lost his dad and brothers when he was little and Anderson Cooper lost a brother and his mom recently and you know and the, what you went through something gets hollowed out in a good way it's like there's like gratitude because existence is miraculous yeah it's miraculous and mysterious and there's suffering you know and uh suffering in what he said in terms of empathy suffering lets us know that other people suffer and that we want to be kind and to show up you know, so that just reminded me you know, what your story and then what he was saying there. Mm-hmm. So I recommend people check that interview out. It's really yeah. beautiful. Isn't it, isn't it fascinating, Ryan, that he's able to, to sort of summarize it in such a simple way. Again, just this elegant simplicity. And he, he's able to use phrases where if you just heard the phrase, you know, does that sound Catholic or does that sound Buddhist? He actually says in that interview, he's like, he's like, so I'm either Catholic or Buddhist. <laughs> There you go. Yeah. And I think that's too, like in terms of simplicity, that's, yeah. a, that's a big shift in terms of the developmental stages of awakening is that things get, I, my experience and other people I know, things get simpler. Like you don't have to have a bunch of pizzazz, you know, to talk about things. And that can be tricky for somebody who's a beginner in particular in a, beginner, in a tradition that has a lot of hoorah 
you right. know, because they can see that and gloss right over it and be like, there's, no, oh, that's not really profound. That's just whatever, you know, there's something else. It's like, no, that's right there. Yep. Yep. You and know? it's not that sort of anti-intellectual drive to simplicity, no. which is the first no, mountain. No, no. The first mountain is sort of the anti-intellectual simplicity. <laughs> the third mountain, <laughs> when, the, when the mountain becomes a mountain again, that's, you know, that's, that's post-intellectual. That's, that's, again, it's the simplicity on the other side mm. of all that complexity. Yeah. Right? And there's a good chance you wouldn't even be able to, to be aware of that simplicity if you hadn't already gone through that yes. painful differentiation and those dark nights and that yes. the suffering and the anguish and the torment of being a separate self in an expanding universe, right? Yeah. Um, where everything really does have some level of disconnection from everything else. Um, yeah. Then that collapses. And yeah. when it does, it's just, a, 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 it's simplicity returns um and in this really really profound way where um you know just everything sort of self-liberates in a certain kind of way that's exactly right my friend yeah, yeah. well has been great i don't know this is i i loved our discussion i i'm hoping it's helpful i don't know if we do we have anybody who's watching live i know like we're we're beginning the show and we we kind of fudge the time and stuff like that. So there wasn't a bunch of heads up, but is there anybody who's live? Or, uh, so or? there there are people watching live. Uh, I think most of them are on integrallife.com slash live, or they're watching on YouTube. Um, but I'll let you guys about know. We'll give you a minute or two to see if you want to do this. There's a link right underneath the video player on integrallife.com slash live that'll bring you into the Zoom app. So if you had something you wanted to say, any feedback or comments, questions, anything like that, we definitely invite you um, to hop on with us. Uh, you can either press the raise my hand button, which will tell us you want us to turn on your camera and then you can talk to us in real time or you can submit a written Q&A. And if you don't have anything for today, that's fine. We hope you guys will join us um, next month for our third show. Um, and because, you know, Ryan, we really do. We want to make this as um, interactive as possible. It's one thing yeah. for us to sort of sit here and talk to each other about, you know, our own sort of experiences and yeah. all that. But we really want to, um, you know, use this as a platform for everyone else in the audience to share yeah. your perspectives and your experiences and your practices um, and all of that. So uh, if we don't have any questions for today, that's totally fine. But I hope you guys will join us um, next time and be a part yeah, of the I forget how much delay there is uh, between the live stream and- what Like 10 seconds. Oh, it's just 10 seconds, okay. Yeah, it's short. Well, we'll give people maybe a minute just in case they wanna yeah. take some minute to get on there. But uh, we forgot, we should have mentioned that at the beginning to say that we would- Yeah, I probably should have. <laughs> well, I'm trying to remember that next time. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, uh, is there anything that we want to talk about, anything coming up? I mean, we should definitely talk about uh, your embodied success course that we have on integrallife.com. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I think we mentioned last time, but anybody who's um, doing their own business or own, you know, organization or um, teaming up with people where you're really trying to figure this, figure out how to put out offerings in the world and have them be sustainable and that kind of thing, then... Um, the things that we've been talking about, how do you do that in the realm of business? And, you know, the thing is like, I even want to think of a different word, but there's just no way around it in the society of like what we're doing because that's how it is. Business, capitalism, things like that. So that course I created to try to bring in more depth to uh, business. It also does have, so it has that half that component of the inner work that we've been talking a ton about today, mm -hmm. applying it to the creative world and functional world of business. And then there's a whole bunch of lessons on actually doing business, mm -hmm. where it's, to me, it's about the, it's a very really complete uh, training, you know, to do that. So yeah. if you're needing that support, then definitely look, look at that. Yeah. Well, and the way I sort of interpret that, Ryan, is, um, you know, the third leg I talked about was skillful action. And yes, that's, that's what the action. course is here to do is to help you understand how to take action in a more skillful and you know ultimately more successful way here success isn't just defined by how much money you make although that's certainly part of it right yeah, and you know in in that that program i consistently don't give an answer like this is the answer right. i'm trying to help people cultivate capacities 
whether it's in the inner realm, like in terms of inhabiting, um, or in the outer realm, you know, how do I communicate with people, you know, and, and get them, uh, help them be aware of what I'm doing, that kind of thing. It's all capacities, you know, of, of how to navigate skillful means because you got to have that responsiveness in life about how to navigate that and feel centered in your work and business. And uh, rather than you chasing something that's always feeling outside of oneself, you know, um, because sometimes success happens and sometimes it doesn't, but it doesn't mean that you can't feel at home in the work you're doing and feel capable, you okay. know? Yeah, well said. So yeah, I definitely encourage people to, to go check that out. It's on uh, integrallife.com slash courses. Um, yeah. yeah definitely check that out. And otherwise, uh, otherwise, brother. Yeah. I think this is, I think this has been wonderful. Well, wonderful. I, this has been really fun. Um, and uh, I hope people have enjoyed it. And I would love to hear if people are watching later. I know there's different places to put uh, comments in yep. for integral life. So share your comments, your thoughts, questions, um, future episodes. We haven't decided what we're going to, we have a bunch of things we listed out. We don't mm -hmm. know what the next one's going to be, but I know we talked about social media. We talked about politics. What are some other topics we're considering Corey? Uh, we had, yeah. So, um, one I wanted to do was one on, uh, inhabiting your life purpose. Uh -huh. Sort of bring in the idea of like an integral ikigai, which oh, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with ikigai. That's a, a cool Japanese concept. That I think it sheds a lot of light on uh, what life purpose really means. Um, uh, inhabiting your anxiety and your traumas is another thing that we could do. Um, but basically the idea is that every episode is naming a particular territory that we want to more fully bring ourselves to. More yeah. Fun. And we'll get more more specific, you know, with these first few episodes, I think we really needed to lay a good foundation that's going to permeate everything else we do, but we're going to dive in much more specifically. So if there are areas of life or themes that you're interested in, you can let us know that too. That's right. Yeah. What I'll do, Ryan, is uh, there'll be comments <clears throat> underneath this video on Integral Life where members can, can, you know, let us know what they think and give feedback and ask questions. Great. I'll also add a, uh, a, a, a question form. So if anyone wants to just submit a question uh, privately, oh, cool. um, we can do that. And if we select your question, hey, we'll let you know. We'll invite you onto the, the program next time we do it so that you can ask us in real time and have a little back and forth with us and it'll be fun. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. Looking forward to the next one. Yeah, brother. Ryan, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. This is, uh, this is a really cool thing we're doing together, I think. Yeah, I've been, I'm super enjoying it and... Uh... I'm, uh, I hope uh, listeners have been enjoying it too. Totally. All right, buddy. Well, I love you, man. And I will talk to you soon. All right. And uh, to everyone else out there, I'm Corey DeVos. That's Ryan Olke. And we will talk to you soon. Bye.